Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alberto Raffero from University of Torino, who will speak to us today about three-dimensional rotationally invariant generalized Vichy solitons. So please, Alberto. Okay, thank you very much. And also many thanks for the possibility of presenting the results here in the seminar. So today I'm going to focus on, uh, as the title says, three-dimensional uh, generalized Vichy solitons which have a rotational symmetry uh, on R3. And in particular, I will start uh, with some motivation of the work I did uh, jointly with Fabio Podesta from Università di Firenze. And I will state the main result we obtained. Then I will describe the setting uh, where we did our computations. And then I will discuss the existence of local solutions for the equations we are interested, and then the existence of complete solutions. And as I said already, this is based on joint work with Fabio Podesta, which is available on archives since January. And this is the reference if you would like to see more details on about what I'm going to tell today. So let's start. And let me start with the motivation. So let's start recalling something about the Ricci flow. And in particular, it is known that the symmetries of the Ricci flow equation are given by diffeomorphisms and scalings in particular, if you take a diffeomorphism phi of the of a smooth manifold M where the Ricci flow is defined, then it is known that the pullback of the Ricci tensor of the metric G coincides with the Ricci tensor of the pullback of G. And moreover, if you take the scaling of the metric G with some positive constant C, then the Ricci tensor of C times G equals the Ricci tensor of G. And so this uh, suggests that one can consider solutions to the flow, to the Ricci flow that evolve along symmetries of the flow, which are the so-called self-similar solutions. And in particular, in this case, you have a solution of the Ricci flow, GT, which is defined just considering a uh, given metric G, then taking the pullback of G with respect to a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms, and then scaling it by some positive function. In particular, C is a, is a positive function which is equal to one at zero. And phi T is a family of diffeomorphisms which is equal to the identity at time zero so that the initial datum is precisely the metric G. And in particular, one can characterize self-similar solutions by means of the so-called Ricci soliton equation. Uh, in particular, what one can show is that if you have a self-similar solution to the Ricci flow, uh, of this form, then taking the derivative with respect to t and evaluating it at t equal to zero, you will end up with this equation here in red, which is the Ricci soliton equation, uh, which involves the initial datum, g naught, of uh, this solution. And conversely, if you have a metric g which solves the Ricci soliton equation, then you can construct a positive function ct, which involves the parameter lambda, and uh, family of diffeomorphisms phi t using the uh, suitable rescaling of the vector field x, and you will end up with a self-similar solution of the Ricci flow. Uh, the main result that motivates what I'm going to discuss today is this theorem by Bryant, uh, which states that uh, on R3, there exists a complete steady rotational invariant Ricci soliton of gradient types. So steady means that the constant lambda we saw before is zero. And of gradient type means that the vector field X appearing in the equation of the Ricci soliton is a gradient vector field. Moreover, this example is positively curved and it is unique up to homotopy. And there are various properties of this soliton here. In particular, the original construction by Bryant was on the three-dimensional R3 for SO3 invariant steady solitons. Uh, later, Ivy proved that uh, the construction can be generalized to obtain SON invariant steady gradient solitons on Rn that are complete and positively curved. And you can find, for instance, the complete proof in the, in the first book of the series on the Ricci flow. And what is more is that this uh, soliton satisfies some remarkable properties that have been proved uh, around 2012. The first one was proved by Angen and Eisenberg and Knopf, who showed that the Brian soliton is a singularity model for the, gen for the degenerate neck pinch for the Ricci flow. And moreover, 
in the same year, Brandel showed that if you have a three-dimensional complete non-flat steady Ricci soliton, which is canon collapsed in the sense of Perelman, then it is isometric to the Brian soliton up to homotopy. And it showed in this way something that was conjectured by Perelman itself in his paper. So these are some properties that uh, satisfies the Brian soliton and tells us the role it plays in the study of the Ricci flow and the understanding of singularity behavior of the Ricci flow. Uh, so let's move to the case of the generalized Ricci flow. So let me focus on the this version of the generalized Ricci flow. So I stated for pairs given by Riemannian matrix G and closed reforms H. And as you know, the evolution equation uh, is similar to the, for the metric is similar to the one of, uh, of the Ricci flow. There is this additional sum on the, which I called calligraphic HGT. Uh, GTHT, uh, which is a symmetric tensor, which can be defined starting from the metric G and the three form H as described here. And moreover, the three form H has to evolve in the direction of minus its algebra fashion. Uh, now, if you consider this flow from the point of view of generalized geometry, then you know that uh, the space of generalized metrics is not invariant under scaling. And so you cannot consider scalings of both the Riemannian metric and the three form H. Nevertheless, if we forget about the picture and we just focus on this flow equation, then we notice that the symmetries of this flow equation are given by different morphisms, again, as the previous case of the Ricci flow, in particular, if you take the pullback of the algebra plasion of H with respect to the metric G will be the Laplacian of the pullback of H with respect to the pullback of G. And similarly, the symmetric to tensor calligraphic H determined by the pair G and H is just the symmetric to tensor determined by the pullback of these two guys here. And moreover, uh, you can also consider simultaneous scalings of the pair GH. And so you, send, you will send GH to CGCH for some positive C. And again, since the Hodge Laplacian of CG of CG is one over C, the Hodge Laplacian of G, you would get that this first uh, term here is invariant under this uh, scaling. And similarly, you can show that since uh, when you scale G as CG, then you will get here on two forms, one over C squared times G. Uh, then also the symmetrical tensor H, calligraphic H is invariant under this simultaneous scaling. And so this is, uh, here I would like to remark that this is consistent with one observation that is written in a remark in the book by Jeffrey Mario on generalized Ricci flow, where they say that this is one possibility that one can, one can consider when looking at the Ricci, the, the generalized Ricci flow equation. So in particular, since uh, you have this type of symmetries, you can mimic what's going on for the Ricci flow. And in particular, you can consider self-similar solutions, which are just given by uh, solutions which evolve the initial datum GH uh, by pullback by a time parameter family of diffeomorphism PT and by a scaling by a positive function CT. And by, by just doing the same reasoning you do for the Ricci flow, you, will sh you can show that this is a self-similar solution, the generalized Ricci flow, if and only if the pair GH satisfies this system of equation series, and it is, by analogy, what we could call a generalized Ricci soliton. And I shall denote, I shall shorten this notation here with GRS from now on. So here we have the Ricci tensor of G, which is given Again, as it was given in the case of the Ricci soliton, and we have this additional summon here, which involves the symmetrical tensor calligraphic H. And then we have this equation here for the Laplacian of H. Uh, the other point of view, which does not take under consideration the possibility of scaling the, uh, the simultaneous scaling of the pair GH, will give you an equations which is a system of equations which is similar to this one, but without this two lambda h here. Uh, so once we have this, we can first of all try to understand which are possible scalings that 
give the same equation. And in particular, if you have a datum which defines a generalized Ritchie soliton, so you have a Riemannian metric, a three-fold H, a real number lambda, and a vector field X that fit into this picture here, then you can scale uh, with a simultaneous scaling G and H by a positive constant alpha. And then you will get again a generalized Ritchie soliton with expansion constant alpha to the minus one times lambda and with vector field alpha to the minus one x. And moreover, you will also get a generalized Ritchie soliton if you change the sign of the three form H. And this follows since nothing changes in the second equation while uh, the symmetrical tensor calligraphic H is unchanged by this type of transformation of the three form. So these are symmetries that will play a role in what I'm going to tell in the construction uh, of the steady generalized Ritchie solitons I'm going to describe. Uh, let me say something more. Uh, so if lambda is zero and if X is uh, you know, an infinitesimal isometry of the metric and let's say an infinitesimal automorphism of the three forms, so the derivative of both G and H with respect to X are zero, then the pair GH is a fixed point of, of the generalized Ricci flow. So if you want a generalized Einstein metric, or if you want, uh, as with Fabio, we decided to call them uh, bismuth Ricci flat pairs. And in particular, uh, in this case, there are, as we, as we showed with Fabio in our previous work, infinitely many homogeneous examples. So these are, I would say, not rare as examples. And finally, let me also say that uh, there are some examples of known examples of generalized Ritchie solitons. And in particular, these were obtained in the context of the Fourier closed flow, uh, which is known to be gauge equivalent to the generalized Ritchie flow by results of Stritz and Tian. And in particular, Stritz and Ustinovsky proved that there are examples of real four dimensional steady radiant generalized Ritchie solitons uh, in the complex setting, of course. And they obtained also some classification results of such solitons in real dimension four. So examples are known uh, in dimension in real dimension four, but let's move to the main result I'm going to discuss today, which is motivated by this problem. So we have an analogous mm, definition of solitons for the generalized Ritchie flow, uh, which is similar or extends if you want the definition you have in the case of the Ricci flow. And so one may ask uh, if there is an, anal an analog of the uh, Brand's result in this case. So in particular, if there exists SO3 invariant steady generalized Ricci solitons with non-zero three form H on the R3. And of course, if H will be zero, is identically zero, then you will get uh, as usual the a steady SO3 invariant which is solito. And the result we proved recently with Fabio is the following. So on R3, we have a one parameter family of pi wise non isometric, complete, and positively curved with steady generalized which is solitons, which are invariant under the action of SO3. So they are rotational invariant. These are of gradient type and have non zero torsion. So in this setting, the answer to the problem is affirmative. And moreover, there is, as you may notice here, a big difference from, between this case and the Brian's results that I recalled before. Since, since in this case, we obtain a one parameter family of pi wise non isometric solutions of the equations I discussed, I introduced before. So let's move to the setting and let's see how to prove this result. So we focus on the three-dimensional Euclidean space L3 and now with the standard action of the special orthogonal group SO3, which acts by rotations, and we assume it has an SO3 invariant metric G. Now this action of SO3 on R3 is a homogeneity one action. In particular, if you have a look at the obvious space of the action, you will get the half line of uh, non-negative real numbers. Uh, what's going on here is that the origin is a fixed point of the action of SO3 
and so it constitutes what is called a singular orbit of the homogeneity one action. In particular, the isotropy of this point will be the whole group SO3. If you move away from this point, you take any other point and you consider the orbit of that point, then you will get a sphere, which is centered at the origin. In particular, this is a co-dimension one submanifold of the space R3. And so the action is by homogeneity one. And what we can do, and what one can do uh, in every, every time one has a homogeneity one action, is to choose a regular point, so a point where, which is not singular, and consider a geodesic which is orthogonal to the orbit pass, uh, of to the orbit determined by the group through that point. And the geodesic can be extended to a geodesic which is orthogonal to all, to all orbits. And in particular, in this case, what we can do is to fix this so-called normal geodesic gamma, which it is convenient to assume that coincides with the positive real, uh, let's say non-negative part of the X axis here. Uh, so in particular, this is a geodesic that intersects all orbits orthogonally. And the philosophy here is that we, want, we would like to study a problem, which is a PDE problem, which concerns solving the generalized Ricci soliton equation in this case, which are PDEs for the metric G and the three form H, then if we have this homogeneity one assumption, so we have this action of the group that preserves the objects we are interested in, so the, the metric, the, the three form and so on, then what's going on is that the PDE becomes an ODE that can be described along this normal geodesic. So this is the idea of this picture. So once we fix this, we can consider the regular points for this action. So we fix any T in the interval zero plus infinity with zero excluded. So gamma of T, a point of the geodesic will be a regular point. And so if you consider the orbit determined by the action of SO3 at the point gamma T, you will get what is called a principal orbit. The stabilizer of S of gamma T will be isomorphic to SO2. And so this orbit will be isomorphic to the homogeneous space SO3 mod SO2, which is isomorphic to the two sphere. And moreover, since this is in particular symmetric as a homogeneous space and in particular symmetric space, you can consider a reductive decomposition of the Lie algebra of the Lie group SO3. And so it will split as the Lie algebra of SO2 uh, plus a uh, two dimensional complement, which is invariant under the joint action of SO2, and which can be identified with the tangent space to this cosette space at the identity cosette, or if you prefer from the point of view of this picture here, it is it can be identified with the tangent space to the orbit, to the SO3 orbit containing the point gamma t at the point gamma t. And uh, for future reference, I will denote by E1 and E2 a basis of this uh, subspace Gothic M. So in particular, E1 and E2 will be two uh, matrices, if you want, of the Lie algebra of the Lie group SO3. Now, another general feature of uh, homogeneity when actions is that if you consider the union of all regular orbits, so the union of all spheres in this case, you will get an open and dense subset of the space you are considering. So in this case, it is R3. And indeed, in this case, what we have is that the regular part, so the union of all orbits is just R3 minus the origin, which is isomorphic and actually equivalent to isomorphic with respect to the action of SO3 to the interval zero plus infinity times the homogeneous space SO3 over SO2, and so it is isomorphic to the, say, positive part of the real line times the two sphere. So this is the geometric situation we are considering, and now we will put into play all the relevant tensors which have to be SO3 invariant. I already mentioned the metric here, since we are considering a normal a geodesic which is normal to the orbits. Let us focus now with in more detail to all the relevant SO3 invariant objects that come into the picture. <laughs> 
So the matter G, the three form H, and the gradient vector field X. So let's start with the metric. Again, a general result, say uh, about homogeneity when actions, says that if you consider the regular part of the manifold, which is just R3 minus the origin, and the restriction of the metric to the regular part, then you will get that this per year is isometric to, in this case, this R plus cross the homogeneous to sphere with this metric here. So you have the metric, which is a warped product. So you will have this line element. This is the line element of R plus, and you will get this plus some positive function phi squared times the S3 invariant metric of constant sectional curve to one on the two sphere. So you can focus, instead of focusing on, the, on this picture here, you can focus on this picture here and in particular simplify a little bit all computations since you will have a warped product metric, which is defined on this space. And you know something about the geometry of this metric with sigma squared since, as I said, it is SO3 invariant, as an SO3 invariant metric on the two sphere, which, of, which is of constant section of curvature equal to one. Uh, of course, this is defined on R3 minus the origin. And if you would like to extend it over the whole R3, you will need to impose some conditions on the function PT. And these were, for instance, determined by Kazan and Warner in a paper of some years ago, and can be found also in the, paper, in the book, uh, on the, on, in the first book by Cho and Nob from the Ritchie Flow and in the, Riemannian ge in the book on Riemannian geometry by Peterson. So if you have a metric of this form, then you know that this extends, uh, and which is of course defined on R3 minus the origin, it extends to a smooth metric on the whole R3, if and only if the function phi appearing here extends smoothly at t equals zero to another function of t with the first derivative at time equals zero, which is equal to one. And the idea here is that you just rewrite this metric here using the usual, uh, let's say, standard coordinates on R3. Then you will get some functions, some coefficients that depend on this Pt. And then you have to understand when they make sense of, uh, on the whole R3. Uh, as for what concerns the SO3 invariant gradient vector field, here we would like to consider an uh, an SO3 invariant function. So this will be a function F, which will depend on the coordinate T and not on the space variables and not, oh, sorry, on other space variables. And in particular, the gradient will be something like the first derivative of F times the radial vector field, which is tangent to the normal geodesic. And in particular here, F is a function, which is defined again on the open interval zero plus infinity and which has to extend smooth, uh, smoothly at t equals zero to an even function of t uh, in order to uh, extend over the origin and so in order to define this vector field here on the whole R3. And moreover, since here we are considering the gradient of f, of course, f will be defined up to an additive constant. And so without loss of generality, we may assume that at time zero, f is equal to zero. So this tells this condition here tells tell us how to extend this metric G here, this warped product metric G here, and this vector field gradient of F here, which are a priori defined on R3 minus the origin over the whole manifold R3. So we are we have still to check the generic SO3 invariant three form H, and here we do not have so much much space uh, to construct three forms. And in fact, the most generic, the most generic three form you can construct will have this expression. So you will have some function H of T, which again, which is defined on the open interval zero plus infinity, uh, which multiplies the three form given by DT wedge E1 wedge E2, which is nothing but the volume form of the two sphere. In particular, what, it is, what is evident from this expression here is that this three form H is always closed. And again, if we would like to understand 
which is the condition we have to impose on the function small h in order to extend the tree form h to the wool r3, then we have to rewrite the, this expression here using the standard Euclidean coordinates. And let me say, let me give some more details here, which also work for the previous cases I just briefly mentioned. So the idea here is that we can consider the fundamental vector fields uh, that are induced by the vectors E1 and E2, so EI in this notation here, which are vectors in the belonging to the Lie algebra of the Lie group SO3. So this EI hat along the normal geodesic can be obtained just considering this object here, which is an element of a curve uh, in the Lie group SO3, which is just obtained by taking the exponential of uh, some real uh, number S times the matrix EI belonging to the Lie algebra of SO3 and acting on gamma T and then taking the derivative at time S equal to zero. So you will get the fundamental vector fields and making some computations which are very explicit in this case, you will get that the fundamental vector fields E1 hat and E2 hat have these expression series here with respect to the standard coordinates Y and Z on R3. And so in particular, you can rewrite this expression over here of capital H uh, along gamma T using Cartesian uh, standard coordinates on R3. And what you will end up with is this expression here, which tells you that capital H can be written as HT over T squared times the standard volume form on R3. And this tells you that in order to extend this three form H to the whole R3, this uh, quotient here of HT over T squared must extend as an even function of T, but this is not, so, uh, and so in particular, this implies that the three form H extends to a smooth closed three form in the whole R3, if and only if the function HT extends smoothly T equals zero to an even function of T, which must satisfy this constant here. So at zero, it must be equal to zero. So we have all, all conditions we need to proceed. So now let us focus on the steady, on the steady gradient generalized which is solid an equation. So we do not, we have lambda equals zero. So we do not have lambda G in the first equation and the two lambda H in the second equation anymore. And moreover, the vacuum field X is now the gradient of some function F. And as for the first equation, it is known that one half of the lead, of the lead derivative of G with respect to the gradient of F is just the action of F with respect to G. And moreover, since H is closed, here the Laplacian is just the, the star of H and uh, the, lead derivative, the lead derivative using Cartan's formula becomes the differential of the contraction of H with the gradient back of field of the gradient back of field gradient to F. And let me also observe that in particular, in this case, we may replace the second equation, which appears on the right-hand side of this by implication here, with the equation saying that the co-differential of H is minus the contraction of H with the gradient of F. Since this, of course, implies this equation here, and moreover, this is also related to the usual equation one gets uh, for steady generalized Ricci solitons when considering these objects in generalized geometry. And if we do not do this assumption, of course, we can proceed considering this equation here. Uh, and in the particular setting we are considering, it is possible to show that any solution to this equation must satisfy also this equation here. And so we are not losing anything in considering this. So now we consider the data, Riemannian metric G, three form H and gradient vector field X as before along the normal geodesic gamma T. And what we can do is to compute all the relevant objects appearing here. So the Ricci tensor of G, the Hessian of H of the function F, the symmetrical tensor calligraphic H, and also the co-differential of H and the contraction of H with the gradient vector field. And what 
so we will we obtain our all these expressions here so in particular as you can see uh, you will have uh, some apart both for all the rigid tensor the action of f and the symmetrical tensor calligraphic h uh, so all of them will have a part which is in the direction of dt squared and moreover they will have a component which multiplies the uh, Riemannian metric on the two sphere of constant section of equal to one. And as for what concerns this, the equation involving H, so the second equation here, the relevant objects you obtain, the, the relevant expressions you have are the following here. And in particular, these are some function of T times the volume form of the two sphere. So, as I said before, here we have a problem, which is a problem that involves PDEs for the metric G and the three form H. And the homogeneity one assumption for the action allows us to restate this problem as an ODE problem, as you may imagine uh, looking at these expressions here along the normal geodesics we have fixed at the beginning. And in fact, if, you, if we plug all these expressions into the system here, we will end up with a system of this form, where here in the first line, we have, in the first equation, we have what we obtain comparing the coefficients of the metric uh, of constant section of curvature one on the two sphere, appearing in the expressions of the rigid tensor and so on. Here is just a scaling by phi squared of the coefficients of the element dt squared appearing again in the expression of the rigid tensor and, and of all symmetric tensors involved in this picture. And this last equation here is what we obtain in the equation involving the three form H. So the goal now is to look for smooth uh, solutions of this system that satisfy the conditions we discussed before. So we want smooth solutions which satisfy certain symmetries. We want phi to be an odd smooth function whose derivative uh, at time zero is equal to one. We want f to be an even function which is zero at time zero. And we want h to be an even function which is zero at time zero. And which is the idea uh, behind all of this is that if we, if we obtain a solution which is defined on some small interval, let's say zero epsilon, including zero, then this will correspond to a steady gradient generalized which is solid on, defined on some small ball contained in R3, which is of course the ball, uh, small ball around the origin. And if we are able to, to show that there exists a solution satisfying all these constraints here, which is defined on the whole uh, interval zero plus infinity with zero included, then this will correspond to a complete steady gradient generalized Ricci soliton on R3, which is invariant under the action of SO3. So these, is, these are the goals now. And the first- Sorry, Alberto, uh, yeah. can I just ask, yeah. is it easy to show that if it's defined globally, then it's automatically complete? Yeah, in this case, yes, uh, uh, you just have to look at the length of the geodesics, which uh, eventually will be infinite. Okay, thank you. Okay, so at this point, if you have a look at this uh, last equation here, which is the one coming from the three form H, uh, you immediately see that you can rewrite this in this form. And so in particular from this, you immediately get that H is some constant multiple of phi squared times the exponential of F. Uh, and so in particular, what's going on is that H is completely determined once we know phi and F. And if you, if you take this expression here and plug this into the system I wrote before, then you would get this and rewrite, uh, rearrange the terms and rewrite uh, that system in a nicer form. 
then you will get to this system of ODEs, which I shall denote from now on by star, and I shall refer to from now on with star, which is singular at time zero. So uh, since we know we want phi to be zero at time zero. Uh, so some remarks on the system, which is the system that at the end of the day we would like to solve. So if k is equal to zero, and so if this small h is identically zero, and so if the three form h is identically zero, then this system star is the system that was obtained by Bryant. So the difference between our situation and Bryant's situation comes from the fact that here we have these two summons in red that appear. And at this point, what both me and Fabio did was to ask some colleagues working in analysis whether knowing that Brian proved the existence of a complete solution for this system when the two summons in red are not uh, present. So the question was whether it is possible to deduce the solution, the existence of a complete solution of this system here with the two summons in red included. And all people we talked with stayed shortly that the answer was no. So it is, there are no general techniques, especially because of the fact that this is a singular system of bodies to use Brand's result to, uh, uh, to deduce something about the solution of this system here. So this is the first remark. And so in particular, this is a brand new problem if you want. And another observation that I would like to make here is that if F is identical to zero, then you can solve this system explicitly. And in particular, you will get that phi will be something like one over beta, the sine of beta t, where beta is just the quotient of the absolute value of k over two. And this is a solution which is defined on this interval here. And this corresponds since f is identical to zero. And so since the gradient, vector field is zero corresponds to an SO3 invariant fixed point of the generalized Ricci flow, which is defined on a small ball inside R3. Uh, but of course, uh, we are interested in the case where K is not zero. So let's see what's going on here. So first of all, if we use limits and uh, the L'Hopital rule, uh, then we see that both equations uh, of the system star will give this expression here for the third derivative of the function phi evaluated at zero. So you just take the limit as t goes to zero plus of the third derivative of phi, use the equations of the system star, which is the system here. And both of them will give you this last uh, expression. And from this, we obtain this expression in red, which tells us how the second derivative of f at time zero is related to the third derivative of phi at time zero. And of course, here we see that again, the constant k comes into play. And in particular, in Brian's case, so in the case of Brian Soliton, we don't have this last summon here. And so the relationship between the second derivative of f and the third derivative of phi at time zero will be just the one you see here. So this is useful because it tells us uh, what's going on sufficiently close to zero. And in particular, if we let Q uh, to be equal to the third derivative of phi at time zero, then the Maclaurian expansion of uh, phi t and f t have the full, uh, this expression here for the first sum. So phi t will be something like t plus one over six Q t to the power of three. And f of t will be something like this. So we have here one over two, then two q plus k squared over two that multiplies t squared. Uh, so this is what's going on around zero and which tells us something about uh, the behavior of these two functions when we are very close to zero. What we observe from this is that there are two free parameters that come into play. There is Q and there is this K here, which let me recall comes from the three form H that we have expressed in terms of phi and F. 
Uh, and again, as you may imagine, in Brian's case, there is not this k squared over two, and so you have only one preparameter. And here is where the scalings of the solitons come into play, since using scalings, we may fix these parameters here. And let me discuss how. Uh, so if we have, as I said before, a steady generalized which is soliton, so I haven't written here lambda equals zero, uh, so we have the metric G, the three form H and the vector field X. Then we get another set of generalized soliton for every positive alpha, uh, which is given by alpha squared G, alpha squared H and alpha to the minus two X. Now, if we are in the case of Bryant, so if K is equal to zero, then it is possible to show that the system star is invariant under the transformation here. So you start with Ft and Ft, you just introduce a new time parameter S, which is just alpha T, and you will end up with two new functions, Phi twiddle S and F twiddle S, which are defined in this way. Plug them into the system star, and you will see that you will get the same equation where now the parameter is S as is not uh, T anymore. And what's going on here is that if you take the third derivative of p twiddle and evaluate it in, at zero, then you will get one over alpha squared q. And then this tells us that up to scaling the whole data, so up to scaling the soliton, and so up to and up to reparameterizing in time, one can focus in on two relevant cases, which is the case where q is equal to one and the case where q is equal to minus one. In the, first, in the first case, you will get an incomplete solution. And in the second case, you will get a complete solution. And these two uh, results here were those obtained by Brian. And so this tells us also how the, let's say, complete solution come from, which properties it has around zero. Uh, when K is not zero, uh, we also have the, function h, which is involved. And in particular, the same transformation gives this type of transformation for the function h. You will get this h twiddle of s, which is k over alpha times this phi twiddle squared times the exponential of f twiddle. So again, we have phi twiddle and f twiddle as before, but then here we have this scaling of uh, k. So what's the difference? from this case and the previous case is that we can use scaling to fix the parameter k. But when it is fixed, we have control only on it. And so the parameter q stays free. And so this is rough, this let's say roughly explains why in the case of Bryant, at the end of the day, you will have a unique solution up to scaling while here we will have a solution with, that will depend on one parameter. Uh, okay, so let's move on. We can fix K and in particular, since as I recall before, uh, if you have uh, G H X that defines uh, general, a steady generalized which is soliton, then also G minus H X defines uh, generalized which is soliton of the same type, then we can consider a positive K to be positive since up to changing the sign of H of capital H and we can fix since it is convenient K equal to the square root of two. So that in this way, the coefficient of the last two extra summons that uh, differentiate that appear in addition to the expressions that variant obtained are equal to one. So the system star has now this expression here and we have used the scaling of the soliton to obtain this expression. And the search of complete, uh, for complete SO3 invariant steady gradient generalized to solitons on R3 boils down to this problem here. So we want to study the existence of smooth solutions, TF to this system star here, which are defined on the whole zero plus infinity with zero included and satisfy the conditions we want. So we want phi to be an odd function whose derivative at uh, zero is one, 
and we want f to be an even function which is zero to zero. And so the first thing to do is to understand whether the local solution exists, otherwise we won't get anything. And for local solutions, what we can prove is the following result. So for each Q you take in R, there exists some positive epsilon and a solution, let's say phi F defined on and this small interval minus epsilon epsilon, which solves the system uh, star on minus epsilon epsilon minus the origin and satisfies the required conditions. So phi is odd and it's derivative at time zero is one, f is even at a time zero it is equal to zero. And moreover, this parameter, this q here is the third derivative of phi at time zero. What's the idea of the proof? So we know that phi is, uh, must be an odd function. So we write it as t times some event function A, which is equal to one at zero. And we consider these uh, vector valued functions, uh, let's say P and Q. So P will be just the pair AT and FT, and Q will be the pair given by their first derivatives. Now, uh, at time zero, P is equal to one zero, and sorry, and Q is equal to zero zero for the properties we know. And the system star after some works can be written in this form here uh, for certain, let's say, vector valued functions A, B, and C, which are valued on R2. So as you can see, P prime of course is equal to Q and Q prime is as this expression here. So we have one over T squared, this vector, uh, this R2 valued function A evaluated only at P, and then we have these other two functions which are evaluated at P and Q. Uh, so here is manifest, this system is manifestly singular. And so, which is the goal now is to prove the existence of a formal power series which solves the system that I didn't mention. I didn't say this, but I denoted by star prime. So we want uh, a, formal, a formal power series given by let's say P hat, and Q hat, which will have this expression here. And why we need them? Because we can apply a theorem by Magrange, which ensures then the existence of local smooth solution uh, to the system star prime. And uh, I have denoted it by P twiddle. So it will, give, it will be given by a pair A twiddle and F twiddle, uh, whose stable expansion at t equals zero is precisely this P hat here. So, we have to prove the existence of this problem power series. And how do we deal with this? So first of all, with some computations using the system star prime, you can show that the pair P hat and Q hat solves the system if and only if for all the non-negative integers n, an equation like this one holds. Here, L to n is a square matrix of order two, which as one may imagine, depends on n. I have not written the precise expression here, but you can find it in the paper. And d to n is a vector in R2, which depends on p0, p2, up to p of 2n. Uh, we know uh, what, which are these p0 and p2. p0 is just a0, f0, and so it is one zero. And P2 is given by the second derivative of A and the second derivative of F evaluated at zero. And so it will be given by one third of times Q and two Q plus one. So here again, you see the parameter Q coming into play. Uh, what one can show is that the determinant of L of these metrics of the square matrix L to N here, which depends on N is different from zero for all N which are greater than or equal to one. And so this implies that for all n greater than or equal to one, you can solve this equation here and then obtain the expression of p to n plus two in terms of p zero, p two up to p to n. And so in particular, since we know p zero and since, since we know p two and we have freedom in the choice of p two, we can completely solve and completely determine the coefficients of this expansion here for the formal power series of p hat. And so for each choice of Q, there exists this formal power series. And in particular, using Malgrange theorem, uh, we can 
mm, conclude that there exists a smooth solution P twiddle a, given by a twiddle f twiddle to mm, star prime, which is defined on some small interval minus epsilon epsilon. And of course, we have not we have a solution. We do not know whether it satisfies the symmetries we want. So I recall that we want phi to be an odd function, f to be an even function. And so in particular, both a and f to be even functions. But this is not a big deal since we can just consider the p twiddle evaluated at the absolute value of t, which is smooth at t equals zero since p twiddle only involves, uh, let's say, even powers of t. And so this is smooth and it gives rise to a solution to the original system star we are studying, which satisfies the required conditions, so in particular the required symmetries. So at this point, we have a local solution finally. And so for each Q in R, what we get is that there exists an, an SO3 invariant steady gradient generalized, which is solid and which is defined on a small, on a, a small ball in R3. And what's nice here is that Q has a geometric interpretation. So it's not just a parameter. We define Q as the third derivative of phi at time zero, but what one can show is the following. So if we consider the, again, the normal geodesic gamma, then along gamma, we can express the radial sectional curvature. So the sectional curvature of a plane, which contains the radial vector field D over DT, as follows, so this is just the quotient of minus the quotient of phi or the second derivative of phi over phi. And the sectional curvature of the sphere given by the orbit of gamma t by the action of SO3 uh, has the following expression. So it is one minus the derivative of phi squared over phi squared. And what one can show again using limits is that Q is minus the limit uh, for t that goes to zero plus of both these curvatures here. And so in particular, in this way, you can also get a geometric interpretation of Q that is useful at the end of the story to, uh, to prove that the examples we obtain are pairwise non-isometric. Okay, so this is the geometric interpretation. And so let's move to the complete solutions. So now we would like to determine whether the local solutions we have obtained extend to the whole R3, which means that we would like to determine whether the pair phi f is defined on the whole interval zero plus infinity with zero included. And the key, one of the key properties, the key results here is the existence of a conservation law for the system star. In particular, what one can show is that the system star we are considering since the beginning has this conservation law here. So we have this deriv the derivative of this expression here involving the second derivative of f, the first derivative of phi and the exponential of f and so on is equal to zero. So it is preserved. So this quantity is constant along the quantity inside the brackets is constant along solutions to the system star. And using uh, the system, the equations of the system star, you can rewrite this expression here in this equivalent form. So in some, time, in some cases, it is useful to you to see the conservation law as in the first case. In some cases, it is more useful to see it as in the second case. But where, this, where does this come from? Well, this comes from an identity which is proved in the book by Streets and Garcia Fernandez, uh, which is a general identity which holds for steady gradient generalized which is solitons, which is precisely this one. So again, here the idea is that we know the expression of the rigid tensor of G of the three form H uh, along the normal geodesic, we can compute the Laplacian of F, we can compute the gradient of F, we, com we can compute the norms. And then the only relevant derivative we can be able to make here is a derivative in the direction of the radial vector field D over DT. And so at the end of the day, plugging the expressions inside here and taking the, and taking the derivative with respect to T, we will end up with the first expression here. And then, as I said already, if we use the equations of the system star, we can rewrite this first equation in the second way here. 
So this will be a key tool to prove the existence for long times. Now, uh, of course, because as I already said, the conservation law uh, says that the function we have uh, between the brackets has to be constant. And again, now we can take limits as t goes to zero plus of this expression here to determine which is this constant. And in particular, taking limits, we obtain that this constant is precisely 6q plus 5. And as one may guess here, the presence of this quantity here, which depends on q, in the conservation law suggests that the value of Q, of Q may affect the behavior of the solution PF we are studying. And in fact, at this point, what we did with Fabio was to try to, try to um, compute some numerical uh, solutions of the system star using Maple. And of course, the system star is a singular system since we want phi to be equal to zero times zero. And so we computed it, we considered the solution starting very close to zero and using the initial data which were given by the Maclaurin expansions of phi and f that I mentioned before. So in particular here, we obtained these plots, some of the plots we obtained are the ones you can see here. Uh, these are obtained uh, with the initial datum at time t equal 10 to the minus seven with the values of phi and f determined by their Maclaurin expansions. And of course, q may be every real number, but there are, I would say, four situations that are of interest and that one may observe. So first of all, if q is greater than minus one half, then you will see that the function in red, which is p, at some point will go to zero. And so of course, if we, if we starts, as you can see with, starts at zero with tangent with slope, which is one. And then at some point it will go back to zero. And so everything ends here. Uh, and in particular, this plot is obtained for Q equals zero, if I remember correctly. When Q is equal to minus one half, which is the case where the second derivative of F at time zero is equal to zero, since the second derivative of F at time zero is two Q, two Q plus one. Then as you can see, F is identically zero and phi t is just the sine function rescale with a shootable with a shootable constant. And so this is consistent with what I said before. This is consistent with the analytic solution you obtain by solving explicitly the system star when f is identically zero. Now there is this picture here where it says what's going on when q lies in between minus one half and I would have liked to say minus five over six, but if you take minus five over six and you remove some small number, again, you obtain some singular solution. So minus five over six is precisely the value that states that the conservation law is equal to zero. And in particular here is just it's very close to minus five over six from the left. And what you get is that again, the solution at some, the phi at some point will collapse to zero. Uh, so this suggests that probably minus five over six is not the right value, uh, let's, say, let's say before of which you will get a complete solution. But what numerical simulation suggests is that if Q is sufficiently negative and sufficiently far from minus five over six, then the solution may exist for all positive times. And so you will get what we are looking for. And so the, of course, these are numerical simulation obtained with the initial datum, which starts very close to zero, but is not the precise problem we are considering. But in any case, they give some hints about what's going on here. Uh, so let's see how we can deal from the precise point from the analytic point of view with this problem. So of course we have a solution which is defined on some interval, let's say zero epsilon, and we can extend it up to a maximal solution to, to the system, to the problem star on some interval, let's say zero L with some L which is positive. 
and we would like to show that L is equal to plus infinity. Now, what we have are, first of all, are the following results here. So phi has to be positive on zero L, and this is clear because otherwise the system star does not make sense anymore if phi is equal to zero, since if you remember, we have some sums that are something over phi. And then here are the first result that say how Q plays a role in all the story. So the first result we can show is that if 6Q plus five, which by the way was the value of the, con of the expression that we had for the conservation law. So if 6Q plus five is less than or equal to zero, then the function F is negative on the, interval, on the open interval zero L. And moreover, if 6q plus 5 is strictly less than 0, then the derivative of f is negative on 0 islands, so f is decreasing. And what the idea, of course, the first, as I said, the first item is just immediate, which is the idea uh, for the proof of the second and the third item is to use the conservation law and argue by contradiction. And let me say how it works for the second item here, so for the first real claim of this proposition. And for the second one, one can argue in a similar way. Actually, we also did a uh, uh, variables change here. So if you're interested in the second one, you may have a look in the paper. So for instance, let's see how to prove the second item. So we know that the second derivative of f at time zero is equal to 2q plus one. And since we have this bound, on Q, so Q is less than or equal to minus five over six, two Q plus one will be strictly less than zero. So this tells us that F, which is an even function, which is equal to zero at zero, will start and it will, it will be concave near zero. So in particular, it will be negative on some interval which is contained in zero L. And so we may imagine something like this. So the function F will start in this way. Now, by contradiction, we assume that there exists some time, capital T in zero L, where the function is again zero. Recall, I would like to show that F is always negative. Now, if this exists, then what's going on is that there must exist some time, capital T one in zero T, where the function F realizes its minimum in the closed interval zero t, zero capital T. And of course, since it is zero both in zero and in capital T, the minimum must be realized inside the interval. And so in particular, uh, the, prime, the first derivative of F at time capital T one must be zero and the second derivative at the same time must be positive. So we are here. And so if we now plug this, information here into the conservation law, we end up with a contradiction. So we use the first expression of the uh, conservation law where we have the second derivative of F uh, using the fact that the, all the F primes go to zero at T1, you, we will get that this is equal to six Q plus five minus that sum exponential. So this is strictly less than six Q plus five, which by high hypothesis is less than or equal to zero. And so, in one, in one case, we know that the second derivative of f must be positive, And in the second case, we know we see that it must be negative. And so this gives a contradiction. And so f never vanishes. And so it stays negative on the whole interval where the maximal solution is defined. And similarly, you can show again, playing with the conservation law that if now 6q plus 5 is strictly less than 0, then f is decreasing on the interval 0 L. Now, in a similar way, if we use the equation for the second derivative of t, which occurs in the system star, together with the fact that now we know that f is decreasing when 6q plus 5 is strictly less than zero, then what we obtain is a bound on the first derivative of phi. And in particular, we have that uh, the first derivative of phi is bounded about by one on the interval zero L if 6q, 6q plus 5 is strictly less than zero. And the observation now is that to conclude, we need to show that phi is increasing, uh, is monotonically increasing on the interval zero L. 
In fact, if we have that six, Q plus five is negative and Q prime is strictly greater than zero on zero L, then L is equal to plus infinity. So we can extend our solution past time L without any type of constraint. Of constraint. And the idea here is the following. Again, we use the conservation law together with the fact that we are assuming that the, uh, the first derivative of P is bounded by zero and one. And we use the fact that F prime is strictly less than zero to, uh, uh, to prove that the derivative of F is bounded near L. And so both the derivative of F and the derivative of phi are bounded in particular near L. And so we will get that the limit as T that goes to L minus of both phi and F exist and are finite. And moreover, we can use, at this point, we can use the system star to conclude that both the second derivative of phi and the second derivative of F are bounded near L and thus that both the limits of P prime and F prime as T goes to L minus exist and are finite. So they do not make anything strange. Everything is bounded and so we can extend the solution after time L. And since L is arbitrary, we can extend the solution up to plus infinity. So the key result we need to show to conclude is that phi as positive derivative on the interval zero L. And this is done as follows. So the proof is, the, is divided into three steps. So the first step is what they call the key estimate that says that if six Q plus five is negative and phi is concave on some interval, let's say zero capital A contained in zero L, then on this interval, we have this bound, uh, which does not depend on T, for the product of phi and exponential of f. And this, this was the key result to prove everything. So the idea here is that we can rewrite the conservation law in the following form with some manipulations. And we end up with this right-hand side where you can see we have e to the f, which is a positive valued function and so in particular, if you look at this as a function of some, let's say, parameter S, which is positive, positive, uh, positive valued, uh, what we will, so, so let's say, sorry. Uh, if you see this as a function of a variable S, which is positive, then this will bound it above and it will have a global a maximum which is precisely this, this quantity here. So now with some manipulations and some work, what you get is that using this inequality, manipulating it uh, a bit and using the condition that the second derivative of phi is uh, less than or equal to zero, we obtain this estimate here for the product of phi for uh, times the exponential of f. And this is a function which has again a global maximum, which is given by this expression here, which is precisely the estimate we get in the proposition. So once we have this, which again, let me emphasize that follows from the fact that phi is concave, which we have not proved. So this is an assumption here, we get this estimate. So the second step of the proof goes as follows. We know that the derivative of phi at time zero is equal to one. And so we can consider some interval zero capital B where the derivative of phi is positive. And here it is, we have that if we have this bound on Q, so if Q is strictly less than minus five over six minus 25 over 12, and some is strictly uh, smaller than minus 35 over 12, then the second derivative of phi is strictly less than zero on the interval zero B. And again, here the proof is, again, not so short, but let me explain where does this constraint of on Q come from. So after some work, which are various computations and various estimates, the claim follows from showing that 
this quantity here, one minus five e squared e to the two f is positive on an interval i where the second derivative of phi is negative. Of course, the second derivative of phi will be negative for some time since it starts negative. And if we use now the key estimate that can be used since phi is concave, and we use this estimate, this bound here for Q, then this uh, inequality here is ensured. So the point here is that this, S, this bound for Q is needed since we have this five appearing here in this expression. And we tried to, let's say, improve this proof, but at the end of the day, even following different paths, we always arrive at the same point. So we always arrive and in, the in, in a point where we have to show that this is positive. And so it seems, at least for this type of argument, it seems necessary to assume that Q is strictly less than minus 35 over 12. So the third step is the final one, which says that if Q satisfies this, the bound I introduced before, then the derivative of phi is positive on zero L. And so if we have this bound on Q, then the derivative of phi is positive and then everything goes well. Everything, we can apply the proposition, the first proposition I mentioned, which says that L is equal to plus infinity. So let me give some uh, ideas on this proof. Again, Q is negative, is sufficiently negative. And uh, we know that phi is zero at time zero and that its slope at time zero is equal to one. The slope, sorry, the slope of its tangent line is equal to one. So phi starts like this around zero. And we would like to show that in particular, it will, it will have positive derivative on, on some interval, which is, let's say, close to zero. We would like to show that the derivative is positive on the whole interval zero L. So again, by contradiction, assume that there exists some time t naught in zero L where the derivative of phi is equal to zero. And assume that this t naught is the first point where this happens. Then we have that the derivative of phi is positive on zero to zero. And at t zero, the second derivative is less than or equal to zero. So here we have, we may have either a maximum or an inflection point. Now at t equal to zero, the equation for the second derivative of phi in the system star we are considering since the beginning takes the following expression, which I do not, which I refer to with star zero. Now uh, on zero to zero, we know that phi is increasing. Phi prime is strictly greater than zero. And so the second step of this proof of this argument implies that the second derivative of phi is strictly less than zero on zero to zero on the open interval zero to zero. And if you want is uh, less than or equal to zero on the closed interval zero to zero, since it is zero both in zero and in zero by what we say the, or let's say less than or equal to zero also into zero for what we said here. Now the first step and the bound on Q imply that the, so the first step was the key estimate, which can be applied now since phi is concave and Q is sufficiently negative and in particular is smaller than minus five over six tells us that phi squared e to the two f is bounded above by this quantity here. This was, this was the key estimate. And now the bound on Q that we have here tells us that this quantity here is strictly less than one over five. And in particular, if we now consider with this, consider this and plug this into the expression here, this will imply that uh, the second derivative of phi at time, zero, at time t zero is strictly positive, which contradicts what we have up here. So we get the contradiction here. And so again, this tells us that phi starts, the derivative of phi starts positive and never vanishes. So phi prime is greater than zero on the whole interval. And so everything worked well. And so we can extend the solution 
plus time L up to go up to arrive into time time plus infinity. So summing up, what we have is that for every Q which belongs to this interval here, so minus infinity is mi minus 35 over 12, there exists a solution phi q f q, which is defined on the whole interval zero plus infinity with zero included, which is a solution to the system star we were considering, which gives rise to a complete S3 invariant steady gradient generalized rich solitons, uh, rich soliton GQ, HQ, and gradient of FQ on R3. And of course, one can say something more about uh, these solutions. And as I say, these solutions are positively curved and this follows from the expressions we saw before. We know that phi is positive. It's first derivative is bounded between zero and one. It's second derivative is strictly less than zero. And so if you have a look at the expression of the right sectional curvature and the sectional curvature of the, the uh, relay, uh, of tangent planes uh, to the spheres, then you will see that both are strictly positive. Uh, then what we have, so the examples are all positively curved. The matrix GQ, so this one parameter family of matrix is formed by matrix which are pairwise non-isometric. And this follows from the interpretation of Q as the limit as t goes to zero plus of the radial sectional curvature and the tangential sectional curvature. So the idea here is that uh, if there is an, ex is an isometry between let's say R3 with the metric GQ and R3 with a metric GQ prime with a Q prime different from G, then we can use this isometry to stand the normal geodesic we fix for the metric GQ to the normal geodesic we have for the metric GQ prime. And in particular, what's going on here is that using this isometry, at the end of the day, we will see that the radial curvature and the tangential curvature will be the same. And so in particular, the limit as t goes to zero plus will have to be the same. These limits are both equal to, in one case, one, the limit will be equal to minus Q. In the second case, will be equal to minus Q prime. And so at the end of the day, Q, if there is an isometry, you can show that Q and Q prime must be equal. So uh, this tells us that the metrics we get here are pairwise non-isometric. Then we can say something about the asymptotic behavior of the function phi and f. And this is what you can see here. So phi up to this factor, which is given by the constant 6q plus 5 in absolute value, uh, phi t grows as the square root of 2t and f t uh, grows, let's say, linearly as uh, t goes to plus infinity. And in fact, from the plots, uh, if you remember the last, the fourth plot I, com I mentioned before, this was quite evident. So it um, could have imagined something like this by looking at, this, at the expressions of the plot. But of course, it, I mean, it is possible and it is, it, one can actually show that this is the precise behavior as t goes to plus infinity. And finally, uh, again, we know that the, the three form H Q can be written, as I said before, in terms of uh, phi and f. And in particular, here we have the square root of two, which was, which is the value we have fixed for the parameter k. So we can write HQ either in this form here or in this other form here, if we would like to write it only along the normal geodesic or on the whole R3 with respect to the volume form, uh, to the standard volume form of R3. And using this expression, what one can show is that the limit as t goes to plus infinity of both the norm of HQ with respect to the metric GQ and the norm of HQ with respect to the, the, to the Euclidean metric go to zero. So in particular, this is another interesting, uh, let's say, property of these solutions here. So to conclude, let me say just some remarks about what I said so far. So we have these complete examples. By eye-based results, 
we know that the variance result from the steady solid on an R3 extends to Rn acted on by SOM. Uh, the situation for generalized Ricci solitons is slightly different. In fact, what I'm saying here is that I think that n equal three is the optimal case. And this is the reason is the following. So we do not have SON invariant three forms on Rn when n is greater than or equal to five. And so in that case, the problem does not make sense. Uh, when n is equal to four, uh, there is an SO4 invariant three form that can be considered, which is, however, harmonic and implies that any generalized Ricci solid must be steady. Uh, so it, again, I don't know whether there are solutions and even local solutions when the, we have uh, the four dimensional case, but if there, are, if there is any solution, then it must be very particular since it is necessarily steady with uh, harmonic three form H. However- uh -huh. uh, What do you mean there, steady? You, you just mean not shrinking or expanding? Uh, lam lambda equals zero. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the point is that if you consider the equation for the three form H, you will get something Laplacian of H, which is zero equal lambda H twice lambda H, let's say, uh, plus the leader minus plus or minus the leader derivative of h. But again, what's going on here is that h is the up to a constant is the volume form of the three sphere in this case. Yeah. You're not and claiming so, that f is constant. You're you're just saying I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And so at the end of the day, lambda has to be zero. So of course you have a some non-trivial equation for the metric. That's true, because you will have, which is a part, which is again a, a generalized solitary equation, because you will have a sum on the, so the calligraphic, what I call the calligraphic, the symmetric to tensor calligraphic cage will appear in that equation. So it won't be the richest of the usual richest, steady richest soliton equation on R4. You will have some perturbation of that equation. But uh, yeah, if there is some solution, then it will uh, it will have to be to have lambda equals zero and h, which is just a let's say the volume form of the three sphere up to a constant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, okay, so this is part this is very particular because of course, uh, if you consider uh, the case of S O N acting on uh, are and the principal orbits are spheres represented as SON mod SON minus one. So in particular, they are, they are symmetric spaces. And so you do not have many invariant forms. So in particular, the only invariant forms of positive degree are the top degree forms. But however, we can, one can consider smaller subgroups of SON which act with homogeneity one on our N. And of course, this may happen for some particular dimensions. For instance, what we proved with Fabio in some work in progress is that there exist uh, steady gradient generalized Ricci solitons, which are defined on small boards in R7 and which are invariant under the homogeneity one action of G2 uh, on R7. So again, the idea is that if you consider a smaller group which acts by homogeneity one, on a RAM, then you will have more invariant forms that you can use to build up the three form H, the invariant three form H. That's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, then Bryant, in, the, in his paper, Bryant, besides the result on the steady solid and also proves the existence of a one parameter family of complete positively curved expanding bridges solitons, which are invariant under the action of SO3. And so the question, the natural question here is whether there exists an, an analog result for expanding generalized Ricci solitons on R3. So of, one can start. So of course the equations can be easily written down from what we obtain with Fabio since one just have to keep track of the lambda appearing at the beginning. And so this might be an open problem that one may investigate. And of course, since Brian Soliton is known to model 
a certain type of singularity for the Ricci flow, a natural question is whether the examples we have obtained occur as a singularity model for certain finite time singularity of the generalization flow. Okay, so this is all I wanted to tell you this yeah, evening. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, yeah, Vesti, do you have any questions? I, I have many questions. <laughs> uh, no, I'm fine for the moment. Um, yeah, well, first of all, may, maybe I start making a, a comment. I, like these solitons you mentioned at the beginning, actually. So I, I constructed them first before this uh, joint paper with Yuri. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, I, I did sort of construct them, obviously, with like the complex geometry in mind. But in fact, they, they do all split a factor of S1 isometrically. And they're actually, they all exist on S3. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is this compact, this family of compact solitons on S3 um, that we construct uh, with some symmetry. Um, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, of course, I'm very curious about this restriction on Q. So mm -hmm. first of all, this, this 6Q plus 5, that's mm -hmm. the scalar curvature or it's minus the scalar curvature? Uh, uh, which? Yeah, I should make some computation. I can... I mean, I guess it's there mm -hmm. in your conservation law, right? I, yeah, yeah, sure. I can maybe can we go back to the yeah, sure. Here. Uh, or maybe it's on the next slide. I guess it's just a question. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. That's... So, for, yeah, for I wrote this for this expression here, but of course you can. I guess I don't know if that's. Yeah, it is. It is for sure related to the. I think it's minus the scalar curvature probably because the e to the two f term is constant. That should be the norm mm -hmm. h squared term, I guess. The e to the two mm -hmm. f. Mm -hmm. Is it right? Oof. Well, for sure we can. Exp yeah, for sure you can write down the scalar curvature in terms of q. I'm not sure. I'm not completely sure it um, will be six q plus five. Because somehow, I mean. Could... I mean um, I guess every example I know, I believe, has positive scalar curvature. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly clear why that should be the case. But it would be interesting if somehow maybe that is the correct geometric mm -hmm. uh, condition yeah. or something. Yeah, I, I, I have to make some computation for the, Yeah, I, I, um, I take a note for this. I will make some computation. I'll let you know for about this. Yes, okay. But so do I understand correctly that... Um, your numerics suggest that that for six q plus five negative but very close to zero, it it mm -hmm. does it's not complete. There's not a complete yeah. solution. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and I think that the point. Uh, I mean, I can see these also. Uh, they suggest this, of course, as I wrote here. And for instance, this but very close to minus five over six. And for instance, here. I took uh, epsilon equal to 10 to the minus four or something like that. And I so see. they suggest that, uh, yeah, minus five or six is not the optimal bound you can you have to get. And probably, uh, yeah, I think it can be seen also here in the last contradiction we have. As you can see here, there is some more space because uh, using the bound, this bound on Q, you will get that p squared times e to the 2f is strictly less than 1 over 5. And so if you plug it in here, you will get that this is greater than, let's say, 4 over, 4 over 5 over phi. So there is still some more space to probably, there are some sharper estimates, I don't know. I see. But the proof we, we, the proof we did needs this estimate here because of that 5 that appears in one of there is a so the five that appears uh, here. So we, as I said, we tried to prove this proposition here following different uh, paths, but at the end of the day, we always arrive here. So we always arrive with this quantity here with this five here. Interesting. I almost wonder if there's some kind of, I don't know, like a continuity method, like a geometric argument where you just let Q decrease down, or or I mean increase mm -hmm. up 
from yeah, my yeah. stupidity and like but i guess you don't really have a sense if, no, you, if you start your solution for some value of q and it fails it somehow does not extend to infinity you have no sense if it's curvature blow up or if it's just incomplete mm -hmm. or what i guess there, there's not really any sense of why it fails or is that right Yeah, I really don't know. Sure. Yeah, of, yeah, of course. What the numerical simulations seem suggesting is that maybe, maybe, I don't know, this bound here is not sharp. Mm -hmm. That may that may be possible. But again, obtaining the optimal bound for Q mm, is yeah kind of hard i think sure yeah but in any case i think already satis i mean from my point of view is let's say satisfactory having at least i mean absolutely yeah all I, such uh, yeah. All such examples yeah yeah no uh, absolutely yeah i well and i guess i wonder if you if one can even is there um like an openness, like if you have a solution, a complete solution for some value of Q, is there mm -hmm. a complete solution for nearby Q? Is does it hold? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tried to ask this. I, I as I said, I talked with various mm -hmm. colleagues working analysis. And yeah, one of them told me, yeah, well, this, if the system is singular, I don't think you can use such type of methods, but I don't know. I really don't know for so I at some point, I had, we had to ask uh, some colleagues for some, let's say, uh, suggestions about what was known in the literature about such type of systems. And mm -hmm. in any case, this, let's say, these discussions were not very conclusive. So at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess maybe not, what I'm suggesting is a little different because I, I mean, I'm not perturbing the equation anymore. I'm just, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I understand you still have this like singular initial data at zero, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, uh, well, you, you at least have your formal power series solution like mm -hmm. for, uh, for any Q. So, so mm -hmm. if you have like a complete Q, then for nearby solutions, you can at least sort of pull off of the singular uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can sort of pull off of zero with your formal solution and then presumably, at least in this tiny ball, that's like a perturbation of your mm -hmm. genuine solution. I don't know. Yeah, but probably it's still quite subtle, I would think, whether it, whether it could still yeah. be. Yeah, in any case, I mean, mm, it is also difficult to have any clue about the optimal bound where Q has to stop. Because yeah. as I said, yeah, it is not minus five over six. It will be something which might might be very close to minus five over six, but uh, I don't, I mean, the estimates uh, suggest uh, this bound here, probably you obtaining other estimates might also help to improve this bound. I don't know. Well, it would be fascinating if it was somehow related to the positivity of scalar curvature. Yeah, I, yeah. I, but I, 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 I can't really this. like say anything concrete, but somehow that seems to be the case for every example I know. So I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that might be even more, even nicer, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely have to compute the scalar curvature. <laughs> Sure. And so I guess, uh, I don't know, maybe there's nothing else to say, but this sort of uh, G2 invariant example, I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing. You 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 just prove the formal power series. This thing you mentioned on the last yeah. slide about yeah. using. Yes. Um, exactly. And are you like sure it is not complete or is it just you can No, we, we, have, we have. So actually we stopped doing that because it was even more complicated and then we focus on this case 
Sure. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, at some point we were stuck, and so we said, so let's try to investigate some example that might be a little bit more simple. Uh, but of course, we, in our plans, we will go back to take all that example. That uh, that yeah, that's, that situation. That that case. And can you, by any chance, prove? that for Q say bigger than negative five, six, that the solutions are not complete? Probably, yeah. Probably it is possible to do that. Uh, what for sure is happening is that here for the key estimate, everything doesn't work. So if you assume that six Q plus five is greater than or equal to zero, all this discussion breaks up. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe this this suggests the facts. Of course, this is again the key point that allowed us to prove everything. So this is the and so since this does not hold if six q plus five is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, since of course you can mimic the starting part of the proof, so you rewrite the con the conservation law as this and then you won't get a, you won't get any more that this function here as a uniform bound, upper bound okay. uh, so this might suggest that something something wrong should happen mm -hmm. yeah but of course yeah of course it's something that one may may study yeah and i I would bet that uh, one can show that if 6q plus 5 is greater than or equal to 0, then v at some point will collapse to 0. So. Sure. Well, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And I guess like this, uh, in the Brian Soliton, the, the tip the, or the origin is the maximum of curvature. Yeah. In, is it yeah, also? Uh, I, think, I think, yeah, I know that. Uh, I think so. I think so, but I'm not completely sure because in this case, we have this extra summons with the exponential of f appearing. So yeah, that's definitely something that I should compute. I see, yes. Hmm. Well, okay, thank you.